Let's go ahead and talk about what we're going to do tonight. Um, we're very fortunate to have someone that I don't really even need to introduce. Um, Professor Savi Mitra is Senior Associate Dean of Programs here at Scheller and the Professor of Information Technology. And I think you, most of you all know him and he has been here for 20 plus years. So, um, his areas of expertise include IT security, e-commerce, IT governance, um, in, IT infrastructure, design, digital marketing, wow, some other ones, and business and analytics, which is what we're going to be talking about tonight in his presentation on leveraging the power of data. Professor Mitra was faculty director of the Executive MBA program here from 2007 to 2013. And in his current role, he oversees all of our MBA programs. Because of this, I've had the opportunity to work very closely with him. And so I can tell you three things that I know personally about him. First, all of the students love him and love his teaching. So they're always saying, oh yeah, if everybody could do it like, like um, Bobby does, it would be great. The second is he is a wise leader. He's helped us make good decisions. And the third is that he really cares about Scheller and especially about the UVA programs. So I'll let him tell you a little bit more about himself, but please welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Is this too loud? Perfect, okay. It's, it's really great to see so many familiar faces after such a long time. I'm delighted that you guys are here. Uh, you know, I, I'm fully aware that I'm standing in between you and alcohol, which you saw outside. <laughs> so I will try and keep this entertaining and uh, move along as quickly as possible. Um, also, uh, one of the things that we do, in the, especially in the full-time and the evening MBA, I know there are some folks here from the evening MBA, I saw a few, also the full time. Uh, and Brian, who's standing at the back there, our associate dean started this, this tradition. We do this one minute introduction. So every student needs to have a slide and they have exactly one minute. And Julia, who's standing somewhere behind there, uh, times. And then you have to do your introduce yourself in, in one minute. We're, you know, it's a, it's a great tradition. So I'm going to start with that one minute introduction that I uh, use for the full time in the evening MBA. And uh, here it is. So I'm Savi Mitra. I'm the Senior Associate Dean of Programs at the Scheller College. The number 26 that you see up there, young as I may look, that's not my age. That's the number of years that I've been at Georgia Tech. I, as uh, Cynthia mentioned, I love Georgia Tech. I love the MBA programs. Uh, that's a picture of me and my wife at uh, our daughter's graduation. I'm really happy she's off our payroll now. <laughs> On the right are things that really excite me. My uh, research using data and analytics, especially in the area of information security and electronic commerce. I've had the opportunity to work with several uh, companies in that area. And uh, you know we have the data expertise, but we don't have the data. And the companies have the data, and they can sometimes benefit from our expertise. So it's, it's a real great match. Um, I'm a history buff. I love to travel. I'm into road biking. I'm not great at it, but I'm, I, I love to do it. And I'm also a pretty good cook. You, that's a picture of us at our Thanksgiving dinner, although I've become vegetarian in the last few years, and I'm actually dreading traveling to China. Uh, for those of you who did travel there, you know it is not the most vegetarian-friendly place. So, uh, and I've been threatening my wife that I'm going to cook a tofurkey for Thanksgiving. She's not too happy about that uh, either. So that's my one minute introduction. Um, here's what we're going to talk about today. So I, I'll start off with, you know, the, the session is on leveraging the power of data. And we do want to keep it really interactive. I, I, you know, I have a set of slides. We don't want to get stuck on the slides. Uh, so we'll first focus on, can you really get competitive advantage from data? Can analytics give you competitive advantage? And so that's, that's the first question we'll try and answer. And then the second is, 
you know, you're here for a session like this, you do want to see some of the methods and some of the cool tools and uh, techniques that are available that companies are using today. So I'll try and give you a broad overview of that and look at some of the applications. And then we'll sort of finish off with a discussion on how do you implement the insights that you get uh, from analytics. And then once again, you know, let's keep this really interactive so that we can uh, have more of a dialogue than just uh, me uh, talking here. As I said, I'm fully aware that I'm, the real purpose of this is for you guys to come and network and have some fun. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll keep it, uh, try to keep it as entertaining as possible, given the topic. Uh, you, most of you are familiar with the with the uh, Gartner hype curve, right? I mean, there's the you know peak of inflated expectations, trough of disillusionment, and then there is more of a steady increase in um, in the use of the technology and the benefit that businesses get out of the technology. So here's my question to you: Where do you think we are in the analytics hype cycle today? What do you think? Are we at the peak? Okay. You're so, sort of here on the way to the trough. Okay. Any other thoughts? Actual, actual use and actual value. You know, here's here's kind of, and this is just a survey. So uh, this appeared in 2017. Uh, in Sloan Management Review, it was done actually by one of our uh, PhD students, uh, Sam Ransbotham, and he, he does a lot of these uh, surveys and use cases. And uh, you can see that the percentage of organizations reporting that analytics creates a competitive advantage, you know, sort of reached a peak somewhere in 2012, 2013. There was a dip, and there seems to be an uptick again, uh, kind of uh, related to what, Brandon, you mentioned that the companies are starting to see value uh, from analytics. So what do you think? Given this, are we, is this the trough or do we expect another trough um, going forward? Right. Right. That's a great point. I, I do feel that there is more data available. The tools are getting better. Uh, the, the technology is getting better. And so that's not where the problem is. You know, perhaps there is another trough coming for a, for a different reason, which is that the, cons it, the production of analytics has been great. You know, all the tools are getting better. We have more data scientists who are trained, but the use of analytics, the consumption of analytics to make business decisions, I'm not so sure that it has really percolated uh, the, the mass the companies so that they can actually get value from the insights that analytics is able to generate. So if there is a trough coming, and I don't know, I, I'm not great at predicting the future, but if there is a trough coming, then it's probably more because of the consumption of analytics rather than the production of analytics. So you're right that the tools are getting better, but is management and our regular employees able to consume the, the insights that analytics is able to generate. If there is a downturn in this curve, it's probably coming from that area, Brett. It, it just occurred to me that all the companies that are analyzing this data to tell us about the prevalence of data mm -hmm. are compiled by companies that work in big data. So the- Self-fulfilling? I, I, I believe there probably is a skew I don't know right. one way or another, but there's probably some bias just inherent because the people working on these reports here are experts in data, so they perhaps see advantages at right. a different time scale. Than right. Else. No, absolutely. That's where the consumption of analytics comes in, right? I mean, so the production of analytics, great. We have better technology, better you know algorithms. All of that is great. Better data scientists, but is the rest of the organization able to consume the insights that are generated and make actual business change to get the value from it. And that's where the, you know, the, the doubt comes in. Yes.
And so the organizations are not really structured right to get advantage. One of the things we will talk about towards the end is implementation. You know, how do you actually implement the insights? And, and that's, that's a really, uh, really important point. All right, so, you know, let's, let's start with that first question. Can data really be a source of competitive advantage? What do you think? Okay. Right, right, but they're moving more to the content side now, right? Right, and if they move to the content side, will data be able to really give them that same level of advantage? Because once they become a content generator, they're more like a, you know entertainment company, and will data, will data be able to drive the shows they produce? Is that really going to be valuable? That's a question that uh, needs to be answered, yes. Sure. 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 But you know, real creativity might not come from the data, and it might come from just the the script writers and the you know actors and all that. So it's a little debatable whether they'll be able to translate that advantage from data into um, into actual advantage when they become more of a content company. But it's a good idea to me to answer this question looking at it from a little bit of a theoretical lens. And you guys will remember from your strategy class this uh, idea of a resource-based view of the firm. Do you guys remember this from your strategy class at all? And, and the basic, basic theory is that you, can't get, you can only get competitive advantage from a resource, and a resource may be a physical resource, an intellectual resource, it may be a capability, that you own, that the company owns, that's valuable, that's rare, not everyone has it, that's inimitable and non-transferable. So you need to have something which others don't have. That's the only way you can get competitive advantage according to the theory. So if you apply this to the data side, I think there are really three questions. The first is, do I have valuable data that others do not have? And that's really driven by your business model. You know, Netflix or Facebook generates a lot of data because of their business model, because Facebook is based on user-generated data. So they generate data as part of their business model. Amazon generates a lot of data because it's online versus, let's say, a Walmart which may not be online. So what data you have, which others don't have, is really driven by your business model. So that's one part. The second is, how well do I use that data to generate actionable insights? And that is driven by the analytics functions, all the data scientists and all the people you have in your organization that can leverage that data to generate actionable insights. So that's the second part. And then the third part is implementation, which is how well do I translate the insights into actual actions that have a business impact? And that's driven by the whole organization. So where do you think the big gap is? Where, where, do, where is the big opportunity, big gap in analytics? Okay, for in general, for most companies, where can where, sh where should they be putting their effort? Opportunities coming in the whole organization because as a consultant, they don't have the know-how to expand right. the big data environment. That's coming in. Right. So, so let me phrase the question a little bit differently. Which is the hardest here? Which is the hardest? Yes. Okay. So that's certainly really hard because it requires the whole organization, it requires a mindset change in the whole organization. Anything else? Yeah, I think the data, right? Because a lot of the people right. buy the data already put some sort of filter on it and they're selling it to you. Right. So it's you're, all, you're already getting a skewed data there. Sorry. So, so that, that's an important point because this is generated by your, it's driven by your business model. Some business models generate data 
Some other business models don't generate that amount of data. And you always hit privacy limits out here because of because what you can use the data for. You know, if, if you say that again. I, I wouldn't. Are you in the analytics function? Yeah. Absolutely. Right, right, absolutely. So, so this this is something that you can work on. I do not want to to, you know, to minimize the second uh, bucket there, uh, but that's something you can work you can work on. You know, we have lots of data scientists that are that lot of companies. Every every uh, university is coming up with a with a data science program. You look at us. We have maybe I think three thousand or two thousand people in our online MS analytics program and uh, quite a large number of students in our um, physical MS analytics programs. And every university is doing that. So I, th I think we are making headway out here. This becomes hard because, you, because of privacy limitations, because you have to change your business model to collect more data. It's hard to move the needle out here. And this becomes hard because it's the whole organization that's involved. So all of those three buckets are important. But probably, in my view, and we can argue, you know, till the cows come home about this. But probably, the biggest problem today is on the implementation, and perhaps related to the actionable part of this insights, and also in because of privacy limitations in the use and collection of data for companies. But if you look, if you believe the resource-based view, you must have some data that others don't have to get advantage from it. You must be able to analyze that data, and you must be able to implement the insights. So we'll follow this structure in the in the presentation, and let's start first with the data. And I, I want you guys to do a quick thought exercise for me, uh, and take three companies, all related. So if you're on this side of the room, I want you guys to focus on Walmart. Walmart is the world's, as you know, the world's largest retailer. You know, they have about Half a trillion, half a trillion dollars in revenue. What type of data do you think Walmart has on its consumers? So think about that if you're on this side of the uh, of the room. If you're in the middle here, think about Amazon. You all know it's the world's largest uh, online retailer. They have about half of Walmart's revenue, but 232 billion. They're pretty large. What type of data do you think Amazon has on its consumers? And if you're on this side, think about P&G. P&G is the largest FMCG company in the US. They have about 65 billion in revenue. What sort of data do you think P&G or any FMCG company, perhaps Coke, what, what type of data do you think they have on their customers? Let's take just a couple of minutes, You know, wherever you're sitting, just, just think about this, talk amongst yourselves, and we'll come back and do a debrief. And, and think about, Compare the data that each of these companies have in terms of volume, in terms of the variety of data and the speed with which they receive the data. And who has the data advantage here?
All right, let's take another two minutes. All right, guys, let's let's get back again. All right. Okay. I know you guys are having a lot of fun, but let's, yeah, there you go. Do it again. There you go. Perfect. Okay, let's, let's start first with Amazon. So what sort of data do you think Amazon has about all of us? Everything. everything. <laughs> they don't quite have everything, but... Okay. All right, guys, one sec. Yes. Mm -hmm. really hard to figure out what is going on in store so they can actually bring those categories up. Okay, very good. Anyone else? Yes. From our conversation a step further, they have data about things I need to purchase. Right. Exactly. Very good. Very good. Yes. One thing that Amazon has is on their cloud system, they run more companies than anybody else. And they route all of the data into all of those companies. So if they know where you're browsing Amazon from, they have your network data. Right. They can see who else you're seeing. It's on their cloud. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, uh, there is a little bit of a security privacy issue there in being able to leverage the data that you're hosting for others on your cloud platform, right? Of course, we, AWS is the largest, or maybe, you know, neck and neck now with uh, Microsoft. Microsoft has done a great turnaround on the, on the cloud space. Judith? Right. Find it lower and they'll be comparable. What Amazon should be doing with that is looking at that, looking at it as the front end of the buying curve, mm -hmm. finding ways to narrow that that gap between the front end of the buying curve and the closing right. on the sale. Using that data, mm -hmm. pull up the seasonality, get a hold ahead of it, and start doing predictive analysis for the customer's next purchase. Right. Then they'll be able to capture more of that and bring the pricing mm -hmm. down. Great point. Yes. Amazon has been traditionally playing on the price game, but now they are in a position with the help of the data and the purchasing behavior of the customer. They can start jacking up the price, which they have already started doing it. Mm -hmm. and they can actually play on convenience, which is where they are sitting on right now. Like if, if I buy a simple product like you know, mouse, let's say, and um, if that exact same mouse is available at, uh, say, Walmart, and, and Amazon Amazon has a potential and a, and a power to sell me as a prime member, sell me the exact same product for 50 cents more. And I would gladly pay 50 cents more because that saves- Of the convenience, right. Trip to Walmart, right? So sure. They can, uh, and they've already started leveraging it for- Right. Uh, customers. Let's take one more, yes, uh, to the on the back. Yeah, so the consumer might have to be on, but what I want to see is how much data they have about their that is Very good and, point. Because you know, so many people sell on their platform, right? So many retailers sell on their platform. Kind of right. And I'll show you, I'll uh, give you an example of how they're trying to use that data. Um, Keith? Right. Right. 
All right, so you know, if you look at what Amazon has, they have product search data. So if you search on a product, they know that. Clickstream data, how you browse through their networks, how their website, what products you look at before you buy a specific product. They know that, what, what order you search. They know that information. They have multi-retailer sales data. A lot of retailers sell through their, um, through their portal. So they have that information. Uh, they have market basket data. So what products people tend to buy together, they have that information. Uh, individual purchase history. So for me, uh, if, everything that I've ever bought from Walmart, uh, from Amazon, they, they know that information. They keep it for, for a long time. So that individual purchase history, they, they can identify me perfectly uh, through my Prime membership. Um, they have individual characteristics, where I live, you know, what's the income in the zip code I live. They have all that information as well. And they have consumer preferences based on how I search for products. And, and even the reviews that uh, I put in for different products, they have that information which they can use to understand uh, what consumers are really uh, looking for when they buy a product. Let's come to Walmart. So who was doing, you guys were doing Walmart, right? So what sort of data do you think Walmart has? And leave aside walmart.com, which is a pretty small part of their uh, business today. So what sort of data does Walmart have? One thing we talked about was they have a longer history and they've got a lot of it. It's not as, they don't get nearly as specific to the individual. It's more of a mm -hmm. demographic based um, right. type. That's a great point because you know they can't always identify you as an individual uh, because you might buy with cash and uh, you might buy with different credit cards. So they can't really pinpoint you as an individual as well as uh, Amazon can. Right? So they can do that analysis at more of an aggregate store level, market segment level. That, that's a great point, yes. Right, right. So, so if, if they roll back a price, how much more did it sell? Sure. Anything else? So, you know, if I look at uh, Walmart, I mean, they have single retailer sales. It's obviously a single retailer. No one's selling th directly as uh, they're not a platform. They're not a portal for other retailers to sell through. Um, they have limited market basket information. I mean, every time I buy, they can't really identify me individually, and they can't look at other products I have bought uh, because I may not have bought it through uh, Walmart. I may have you know, bought it through another retailer. I don't buy everything through Walmart. So they have, they have market basket, but somewhat more limited than, um, than Amazon. And they have limited individual purchase history, longer time period because they have been in business for longer, but it's hard for them to identify me, as you mentioned, as a, as a specific individual in their data. Now let's move to, to P&G or any FMCG company that's selling through Walmart or through Amazon. So P&G, what sort of data do you think they have? Say that again. Right. So, uh, absolutely, for their product category, they they are selling through multiple uh, routes, and they have much wider for their product category, much wider data than just Amazon. Right. Right, right, and that's that's exactly right. So they they do have store level sales, you know, different stores, as you mentioned, how much they are selling. They have consumer trends. They do a lot of analysis on consumer trends. What sort of products, you know, what sort of features would uh, would consumers like in their products? So they uh, they do focus groups. They do other research. They uh, buy data. They also buy third party data from various agencies to figure out, you know, what sort of uh, new product enhancements they should make. Now, if you look at this, does it seem that Amazon has an advantage to you in terms of the data that they have? Yes and no. Why no? Uh, no is because uh, there are other data providers, second party, third party data providers who can, who can complement whatever their business sure. is. They have a better chance if they can go back and reach out to them. 
Okay, so the, so those guys, PNG, can actually buy some data from other third-party providers, like like Nielsen, for example. Yes. Important information is missing out of PNG. PNG actually has a lot of um, consumer loyalty programs, mm -hmm. programs that go in and supplement the data that will equivalent uh, yeah. be equal to individual right. purchase history and things like that. So they've got additional supplements for that right. as well. It's hard to get consumers to, to use the loyalty programs. So if you go to a Kroger, for example, they would love you to use the you know, card. They give you all kinds of discounts if you use it. Why? Because they want that data to figure out who you are, what you're buying. CVS, you know, print out coupons, which are a long list of coupons, as you might have seen whenever you go to CVS. Yes. Right. Knowing people right. and being able to see how people react to those. Right. Right. And and you know uh, the 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 key point here is that every company may have a, a segment of the data. Walmart, um, uh, Amazon comes pretty close to get to having a large amount of data about you, but it doesn't have everything. So if you look at what data you really need, what's complete data, what data you really need to generate an accurate consumer profile, you can sort of put it in four buckets. One is, of course, the purchase and usage environment. So this is the customer context. Who are they? What do they do? What, what's going on in their lives? Uh, you know, What are the big events in their lives? Uh, who are their influencers? Where do they go for information? That's nothing about their purchase behavior. It's their general context. And perhaps customer demographics, uh, social media, those are sort of the places that you might find a lot of that information. If you look at the, the next category would be desired experience. That is, you know, what does the cu customer seek from the offering? What are their needs, especially unmet needs? And Search and clickstream data, so what features do, pro do people search for when they're looking for a product? What product characteristics is most likely to be clicked on when they're browsing a web page? That might give a lot of valuable information about what customers are really interested in. Then beliefs and associations. So, you know, what are their perceptions? What are customer perceptions? Uh, product perceptions, brand perceptions, and review and social media data might be one source of, the, of that information. And then, of course, the actual purchase behavior, what's the, what's, what's the customer consideration set? What are the products that they consider when they bought this product? And what product did they actually ultimately buy? That's actually the transaction data. So good news, of course, is that not any single company has all this information, but, uh, you know, you might have heard, and actually it was in the news on a couple of days back during the weekend, and it's been rumored for a while that Amazon is trying to get into banking as well. They already do a lot of uh, product um, uh, financing, especially in third world countries where the, re where the pe people who are um, selling through their platform, they might not have the, you know, the, the money themselves. So they, they actually finance many of the retailers who are selling through their portals. Many of the delivery companies that are actually delivering the products, they finance. They're also getting into payments. Uh, that's well known. But they're also thinking about, at least according to the article, uh, of setting up a bank. Because one element of, uh, of all of this data is the customer transaction profile and their financial transactions, which they don't have. So if you take a Bank of America, they probably have much more information about me and what I spend on. And also we have the marketing data that we sell to all the retailers by PNGs. But we have, we cannot really sell that. We can only do an aggregation and let them know what is a cross category purchases right. the individual, not, not at you, can, you can sell the insights, but not the actual data itself. Yeah. Sure. But, but they're thinking about getting into banking and maybe Jeff Bezos one day will have, you know, a trillion dollars to spare to buy Facebook. 
And when that happens, if they have a bank and they also have the social media and Facebook, they will probably have a complete uh, customer profile and consumer profile and know everything there is to know about me. But until that happens, uh, the good news, I think, is that is not a single company has access to your entire consumer profile. Now let's let's get to um, in the remaining time. Let's let's get to uh, to the actual methods and analytics methods uh, that are becoming popular today. You know, there's been a lot of progress in the methods and the technology to analyze data. So I wanted to give you a sort of broad overview of all the different methods that are available today to analyze data and how they're being used. And I don't just want to give you a dump of all the methods. That's going to be very boring in the you know. I think I have about 25 minutes or so, uh, hopefully, since we started a little bit late. Um, so I, I don't want to give you just a dump of all the methods, but to sort of put it in a framework that, that helps you retain this uh, information. So here's, here's kind of my framework of thinking about it. And this is completely you know, from, my, from my head, if you will. So we've always done business intelligence for many, many years. Nothing new there. Um, you know, we have reported on what's happened in the past. We have had alerts and dashboards on what's happening today, what's happening now. And we've even done things, simple forecasting uh, to predict what sales are going to be in the next quarter and so on. That's nothing new there. We've done that for you know, many, many years. What's changed today? What's, what's different today? There is a lot more data. There is uh, you know, cheaper storage, there's faster processing, and there's better technology, which basically means that you now have access, as you mentioned, to a wider source of integrated data, both internal and external. You also have more granular data at a, at a much lower level of granularity. You, you can track a person rather than at a segment level, and longer time horizons of data that you can store. So what this has led to is that if you think today in terms of business analytics, it's not just about reporting what happened in the past, but also understanding why it happened. So I can use data to, to understand what was the impact of my actions on my outcomes. I call that, and the industry calls that, that diagnostic analytics. In terms, of the, uh, in terms of the future, instead of just simple forecasting at the aggregate level, you can now predict how specific actors will behave. You can say, this customer is likely to churn, or that machine is likely to fail. So you can do the prediction not at an aggregate level, but at a specific actor level, because of the granularity of the data that you have. And instead of just showing what's happening today, you can also use models to optimize my actions. So how can I optimally allocate resources to maximize profit? What price will maximize profit? So you can use algorithms to figure out, not just report what's happening, but what can I do to actually optimize the actions that I take today? And that's called prescriptive analytics. So diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive. Those are kind of the three terms. Now, let, now let's look at the methods that fall into these uh, categories. So in terms of uh, diagnostic, you know, we look very quickly at impact analysis and uh, pilots and experiments. Those, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in the details there and the weeds there. Um, in terms of, so the whole focus here is improving decisions. How can I use data to improve the decisions that I make so that I, I invested in something, what was the impact of that in my outcomes? That's the focus there. Then in terms of predictive, it's about understanding behavior. So typically the, the, the sort of things that are done there is are associations. So if I buy this product, what other product am I likely to buy? If I have this behavior, what other behavior am I likely to have as well? So those are the associations, uh, classification, using data to understand which, which uh, customers are likely to churn versus not likely to churn, 
which machines are likely to fail versus not likely to fail. So that's trying to use past data to classify incoming data, which is which uh, customer is likely to default on a loan and not default on a loan using past data and the characteristics of the customer coming in. Can I classify them into two into these two buckets? And then clustering, which is, can I segment my customers based on observable characteristics? So that's the predictive part. And then the, the, the prescriptive is using uh, optimization and simulation to sort of understand what optimal decisions I should be making today. So at a very high level, that's kind of the basic classification of the, of the methods that you likely to see in analytics. And I'll go through a very quick uh, sort of overview of, of each of these. So let's start with the first one. Let's start with diagnostic analytics. And here's a, here's a, a sort of real example. So I don't know if you saw this. This was about maybe um, a couple of years back, actually. Well, one and a half years back, there was an article in Wall Street Journal which said that P&G is cutting about $100 million in digital advertising because they felt that it had no effect on their sales. I've always wondered whether all these ads that we send out for our executive MBA and evening MBA and all that, whether it has any effect or not. It does have? I don't know. I, I always, you know, I'd like to analyze the data to see whether it has an effect. PNG believes, PNG actually believed that we got some data that said, either said it was in a bad place, the ad was shown in a bad website, or it was not effective. It didn't really improve sales. So here's my question to you. How can PNG evaluate the impact of uh, digital ad spending? How would you do that? How would you evaluate the impact of digital ad spending? How would you use data to analyze that? Okay. Okay, so that's kind of the basic idea. So um, suppose you know PNG ran a digital ad com campaign for specific products in a few markets during the last month of 2015. I'm just taking 2015 as an example here. So this is what the data would look like. So you have for every product market, you know, product market may be tied in Atlanta. That's a product market. So did I run a digital ad? One if I did, zero if I did not, and then you have the sales in those product markets, and you might have other information which also might affect sales. So things like, you know, how much was the rainfall? What's the average income in that market? Those kind of things. And you can see that different product markets, the month of December, uh, this is the 2015, that's the data. And I've just shown 10, but there may be many other products, there may be thousands of product markets. So. Going back to your analytical tools uh, days, you hopefully that was the first course in your executive MBA or evening MBA or the full time that was the first required core class that you did. You run a regression with <laughs> you run a regression with sales as your dependent variable, and you're really interested in seeing the effect of this digital ads. So here's kind of the results, and these are uh, the sales are in thousands. So this is actually 7.4 million. Um, so what does this tell you? So it says digital ads, one, four, two, four. And it's positive and significant if you remember from your regression analysis. What does that say? This is an exam question. What does that say? <laughs> what does that say? Say that again? Yeah, fundamentally it says that in the markets where you ran the digital ads, you had a $1.4 million higher sales than in product markets where you did not run the digital ad. Now, do you have to be careful about that analysis? Why? Okay, so let's say you spent $400,000 on the digital ad campaign. So then you have a $1 million you know, extra, right, from this. Is that good? There could be other things that are also causing that as well, so you can't look at it alone. That's a great point. So what you're getting to is that 
you may have chosen to run digital ads in attractive markets. What if I chose to run digital ads in these markets where sales are high anyway? You know, right, right. You typically run your ads in December to get more holiday sales. But the point is that you might have chosen to run digital ads in those markets where sales are expected to be high. And therefore, it's not the impact of the digital ad. It's really the way you've chosen where to run the ads. So if I were running this, what I would think is not to base it on sales, but instead to base it on variance of sales between the Very good. Variance. Very good. So, so that's the basic idea here. If you have sales over time, you can actually do a better job of impact analysis. Because now I have, you know, for the same product market, I have different months, this different years, and I have the sales, and now I can really look at before-after analysis. Some years I did not run in the same product market, some years I did run a digital ad in that market, so what was the impact? And if you have that, and I, I don't want to get into how you would do that, you know, it's, it's actually fairly easy to include um, these other dummy variables to do that, but then you might run and you'll see that the actual effect of digital ads is still positive, but it's less. And what this shows is compared to the years where I did not run a digital ad in the same product market versus when I ran a digital ad in the same product market, what was the extra sales? And this is a better way of analyzing your decision. The point that I wanted to make is, is this first one here, which is you always have to be careful about variables that you have not included that may be correlated with the focal variable. So if I, if I just wanted to see the impact of, does an MBA lead to higher wages? I'm sure that it does. <laughs> but, but if I just looked at people who have and did not have an MBA, you know, you guys all came here came here in the weekends, gave up your weekends, gave up your evenings, you know, took two years off, you're motivated differently. And therefore, your higher wages may just be a result of your motivation and hard work and not the result of your MBA, right? But if I could compare what happened to your wages before and after for the same person, that's a better analysis. So that's the, that's the idea here. <laughs> The, the other thing that you have to be the other thing that you have to be um, you have to be careful about is the focal variable if you if it's correlated with factors that are legal or unethical not legal or unethical to use you got to be careful of that so I was working with a bank and one of the things they were um, looking at was they have hundreds of thousands of resumes that are submitted and they did this analysis look for their existing employees and looked at their pe folks, people's resume and their job performance and tried to relate factors on, from the resume to job performance. One of the things they found, for example, you know, just an example here, is that golf, people who play golf has higher performance. Now that seems an innocuous variable to use, no problem. You know, maybe I will screen all the 100,000 resumes I get based on whether they play golf or not. But you don't know if that, if that variable golf is correlated with other variables like race, like income, which might not be legal or ethical to use. So that's something that you have to be careful about when you're doing this. And then finally, you know, delayed impact. So I may have run the ad this now and the impact of sales was not right now, it may be later on. That's not captured in my analysis. So lots of pitfalls that you have to sort of think through logically when you, whenever you're trying to use data to understand what impact something had on another, uh, on, on, on your outcome variable. All right, let me move to, and I, I told you I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. I'm going to skip over this, um, this part here and come back if I have the time, but I'll, but I'll get to predictive analytics. So we've looked at diagnostic, you know, trying to understand the impact from historical data on outcomes. 
Let's move to uh, predictive analytics. Uh, the most common example that all of you are aware of is when you go to Amazon, they give you lots of recommendations, right? You've, you've seen these recommendations when you go to buy uh, products there at Amazon. And the, I'm not sure if you knew, I thought this was a really interesting statistic that 35% of Amazon revenue comes from products they recommend. That's a huge number. Think about it, 35% of their revenue comes from products they show as recommendations on their web page. So they must be doing a really good job of predicting what you are likely to buy. How do they do that? So the, the basic approach that they use is called market ba basket analysis or association rules. And essentially they analyze transactions you know, thousands of transactions which look at which, and try to form rules which look something like this. Left-hand side implies right-hand side. That means if somebody bought a camera, they're more likely to buy a camera bag, things like that. Left-hand side is a group of items. Right-hand side is another group of items. And they're trying to derive based on their millions of billions of records that they have, what people buy together. And, and the key thing to, to note, you know, everyone gives this example, diapers and Friday evening implies beer. <laughs> I don't know why. Why would you buy beer if you buy diapers and it's Friday evening? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, very, very good. Yeah, very, very good point. So that I was going to come to that in just a second. That's a great point. You know, how do you, how do you really try to get to that causality? That if you buy this, you're really likely to buy that. It may be that, uh, you know, if you go to a grocery store, what are the two things that you always buy? Milk and bread, right? You always buy. So someone might look at that set of transactions and say, hey, if someone's buying milk, suggest bread. But that's just because you always buy milk and you always buy bread, and therefore they, that association will you know, normally come up if you try to do this type of analysis. So what they do is uh, th there, are, there are just exponential number of rules that can be generated from the data. For those of you who are mathematically oriented, it's actually three to the power of K, and K is the number of items which are there. So if you take any uh, retailer, three to the power of 100 is a very large number. I think it's like, you know, it's, it's three to the power of 20 is like 3 billion. Three to the power of 100 is unimaginable. And, and uh, a retailer sells tens of thousands of products. So three to the power of tens of thousands is just a unimaginable number. So what they do uh, try to answer your question is they, they look at three measures, which is one is, you know, what percentage of the transactions have these two items, the left-hand side and the right-hand side? Given every transaction that has the left-hand side, what percentage of them also have the right-hand side? That's called the confidence. And then this lift is trying to get to, what do you expect by chance? If I buy milk always and I buy bread always, just by chance, many of the transactions will have both milk and bread. There's no causality there. So there's another factor, and we don't want to get into how you calculate this, uh, which is compared to chance, What's the lift in probability that if you buy item X, you're also likely to buy item Y? So that's kind of how they're trying to get to the causality. It's not real causality yet, but it's better than what you would observe by just chance itself. So where would you use this? You know, what, what do you think? So recommendations is one. Where else do you think Amazon would use this information? Obviously, recommendations we are all aware of. You buy something, they show you something else based on these rules. Where else? Uh, where you stop the warehouses. Exactly, exactly. So things which people tend to buy together, you might want to stock your warehouses, and they're using it to improve their operations so that it becomes much quicker to, to pick the products. I don't see Cynthia here. I'm, I'm assuming I have till 10 minutes past seven, right? Oh, Cynthia, you're there. Sorry, I didn't see you. Is that okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Is that okay, guys? Yes. All right. 
All right, let's do one more. And this is a very common method which is used. It's called classification. And the idea here is, can I, based on past data, can I arrange incoming data into predefined classes? So for example, can I classify credit applicants as low, medium, or high risk? Can I classify customers as loyal or likely to leave? Can I classify emails as legitimate or spam based on my analysis of prior data? You may have heard many of these uh, terms here. They're all basic methods to do classification. Uh, logistic regression, decision trees. I'm gonna show you one and I'll run, I'll show you the results on, on a data set and, and ask you to interpret that. So we're gonna look at decision tree analysis as one of the methods, but they all basically do the same thing. They're trying to classify um, incoming data into one of two groups. That's fundamentally what they're trying to do. So the, the basic method that you follow is you, your old data, your past data, you divide into a training set on which you train your algorithm and a test set once you've trained the algorithm to test your algorithm to see whether it's doing well or not. And then after you've done that, you know, you want to check the accuracy on the, on the test data set. If it works okay, then you apply the model to your, your final, uh, your incoming data to classify them. So you train based on your past data, you test based on your past data that you have kept separate. And then once your algorithm is trained, when incoming data comes in, you apply it to the incoming data to classify into, are they likely to churn, not likely to churn, are they likely to default, not likely to default, et cetera. So here's kind of what the, once again, this is a method that's used. Here, here's kind of what, what the output looks like. And I'm going to give you, I apologize for this, I'm going to give you a pretty morbid example here. It's, it's the Titanic data set. And Titanic, as you know, you know, um, very few people survived. Actually, 38% of the folks uh, on the Titanic uh, survived. So this is actual data from 891 passengers on the Titanic. And I just, I just used this data set and ran the algorithm to see what it generates, just to see. So I'm trying to predict this variable here, whether they survived or not. And I have a data about a lot of other things, you know, what class they were traveling on, uh, sex, male or female, age, whether they had siblings or spouses, number of siblings and spouses traveling with them, number of parents and children, the fare they paid, the port they embarked in. And I just ran the algorithm, let it lose on this data to see, you know, what the, what this, what the algorithm thinks would predict survival. Same method you can use to predict whether it's a spam or not a spam, whether it's uh, uh, default or not likely to default, you know, the same idea. And here's the tree that it generated. Now, let me explain what this means. So it says here that uh, most people did not survive, that's the zero. 38% uh, is the survival. And this is all the, all the, uh, all the people are in this node. Now, when you break it up by uh, sex, so if you were male, you did not survive, you had a 19% chance of survival, and 65% were male. If you were female, you had a 74% chance of survival, so you survived, it's more than 50%. 35% were female. If you were male and your age was greater than 6.5, that's this one here, you did not survive, you had a 17% chance of survival. And if you were less than 6.5, that's here, you had a pretty good chance of survival, 79%. Likewise for female, if the P class, if the, the class they were traveling on is one or two, first or second class, they had a pretty high chance of survival, 93% chance. If they were traveling in third class, then depending on the fare they paid, there is a difference in the survival. How would you interpret, this is real data, I just ran the algorithm, the algorithm is dumb. It doesn't, it just runs. How would you interpret this? What does this say? 
Go ahead. Rich woman is, what's the interpretation? Yes. Mothers looked after kids. Okay. That's not quite the interpretation. What else? Exactly. People who got up on the boats survived. People who didn't get on the boats did not survive. That's the human interpretation that you make from this. The, the algorithm is incapable of making that interpretation. That's where you know, our understanding, our knowledge comes in to make that interpretation that you know, people who got, who, survived, who got up on the boat survived, people who did not uh, get on the boats did not survive. You were more likely to get on the boats if you were women and children. And also, if you, were a, if you were a woman, then depending on the class of travel, you were more or less likely to get up on the, on the boats. That's the human interpretation. And it's a really good example to show that the algorithm stops at one place. It cannot give you more insights. It's us who has to interpret this data to really figure out what's going on. And then you build your model based on your interpretation of the, of the, of the data. So if you think about predictive analytics, and I think I have two, two more slides. If you think about predictive analytics, once you run all your models, your decision tree or whatever algorithms you're using, you, that, that's going to tell you what are the factors that are important. This analysis was very insightful to tell me what factors were important to predict survival. And then you take those factors to develop a, a scoring model that predicts your outcome based on the incoming data that's, that's coming in. So this is a well-known example. I'm sure most of you are aware of this target example of trying to predict, you know, it's when you, when you have a baby, you spend a lot of money. And it would be great for retailers to predict when you're going to have a baby because then they can send you coupons, right? It's, I mean, that's really important for them. So when they ran all their models, they found that there were about 25 products that when analyzed together, they could assign a pregnancy score, which was very accurate to predict whether, whether someone's going to have a baby or not. Now, of course, if you know the rest of the story, you know what happened here, <laughs> right? Can anyone, ex does anyone, uh, yes? That's right, yes. All right, and then, uh, you know, the final one uh, to, to talk about is prescriptive analytics. So we talked about diagnostic impact analysis, predictive classification. Uh, we talked about decision trees and uh, association rules. And then the last one is prescriptive analytics. And this has to do with using models to try and make the best decision. And this is an example. I worked with a financial services company, a small financial services company that really turned around their business using analytics. And what they essentially did was they developed a really good loan default prediction model. Based on data, they could really identify what's the probability of default for you know, every person, every applicant that comes in based on past data. Decision trees, you know, very, very good model to predict the, uh, lo uh, the probability of default. Now, they also have market segment characteristics. So for every different, so this financial services company gave loans to different segments of the market, um, you know, rural, urban, um, uh, small business, personal loans, various other types of loans. And for each of those markets, they had pretty good information about characteristics. So for each of these market segments, they could predict using their loan default prediction model what the probability of default was. The interest rates were also different in each of these market segments. You could charge more to a consumer in a rural area than in an urban area, things like that. So the interest rate they could charge was different. There are also regulatory requirements that they had to meet. There's also risk tolerance because just because the interest rate is higher in a market segment, the risk may also be higher. So they had to balance that. There was a risk tolerance that, that they had to take into account. And then there are underwriting guidelines as well. So the model that they developed was 
how do I allocate my capital that I have to lend out? How do I allocate it between these different segments so that I maximize expected returns subject to regulatory requirements, the risk tolerance limits, as well as underwriting guidelines? And for those of you who are familiar with optimization, you know, that's a classic optimization problem, right? So framing it in that way presents it as an optimization problem. There are many different algorithms that are available to, to help, you solve, help you solve that problem. And the advantage of doing making decisions this way rather than by gut feel is that you can really take a whole lot of factors into account in making a, a better capital allocation to maximize your returns subject to all the constraints that you have. That's the basic idea. I will close with, uh, you know, with, with one uh, thought here, and this has to do with the implementation. So I'm going to, uh, this is my last slide here. So if I look at why they were able to, why the company was able to use this analytics to really turn themselves around, I think that there, are, there are three things that they did. The first is vision and communication. So strong CEO and top management support that this is the way we are going to do business. We are going to use analytics. This is, this is how we are going to run our business. So that was one big element. The second is what I call process integration. There wasn't a choice which was left for salespeople. So the risk, the, the rate that is quoted is automated. You put in the data in your information, the models predict what the probability of default is. And based on that, there is, they're going to, the system is going to quote a, uh, interest rate. The salesperson has very little leeway in setting the interest rate. So it was built into their whole process. Even the, how they allocated capital was based on the model. So because it's integrated with the process, there was no leeway and you know maybe 90% they, they gave up, they did this way. Maybe there are 10% cases that needs a deeper look, a human element to look at. And then finally, you have to have incentives. So if you want a change in behavior, you have to pay real careful attention to the incentives that people have in making that change. And that was another big thing that they really paid a whole lot of attention to. So I'm going to stop here. Any closing thoughts on, um, on any of this or any of the topics that we talked about? I know I'm standing in between you and alcohol, so <laughs> I'm fully aware of that. But if you want any of the slides, I saw many of you taking um, you know, pictures. I'll be happy to send that to you. If you send me email, or maybe I'll give it to Cynthia and she can send it out. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you.